There's a fantastic wealth in the passages that have just been read us. Were we to take time to adequately tap it, I fear we'd be here all day. I don't have that luxury, nor do you, because you're going to be joining me with in Northridge at 2.30, right? Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. We live in an interesting era. We live in an era of symbols, but only commercial symbols, largely. Culturally, we don't have the range of symbols that we used to. We still have a few. Most Americans still understand the meaning of a flag. We don't always know how to present ourselves to it or salute it or speak to it, but we know what it is, and it's a symbol generally widely recognized. But we've lost connection with many other symbols, and I fear someday Christians might lose connection with the symbols that connect them, bind them, and tie them spiritually and intellectually and historically to a past that's rich and deep and meaningful and powerful. You see, part of a reasonable faith goes beyond the literalisms and sees the symbolic. Part of a reasoned faith knows that there's a depth beyond the superficial that we might read. Take, for example, our Leviticus text. It's a standard text of covenant and blessing, or covenant and threat of curse. In this particular case, it's an admonition to keep certain commandments. Don't create for yourselves idols of wood and stone, precious metal. Don't bow yourselves to them. These fundamental oddities to us translate in the modern context into something else. Materialism, hedonism, addiction. So first of all, we must take the old and appropriate it symbolically into the new. But more importantly, the idols themselves, those things that we elevate in our lives above and beyond God, are symbols of something very wrong in all of us. The tendency we have to deny the place and primacy of the Creator and the Redeemer. When God made us, when He fashioned us of dust, when He breathed into us the breath of life, when He interacted with us, when He helped us to see reality by naming it as the animals were brought to man. Through creation, God said, here's your path to joy and peace and life, and we chose otherwise. And ever since then, God's been struggling to help us regain our focus. We're so desperate for something to see and hold on to, We're so desperate that the time we spend working and the money we earn count for something, that we cling to symbols of wealth and status and power. We cling to the comforts of our material world and existence. We make for ourselves idols that we don't even know we're worshiping. And God says, no, look to my face Look to me for meaning. Look to me for comfort. Look to me for hope, peace, security. Look to me to provide for your blessings and your way. This is the order of things. These images spoken of in Leviticus of wood and stone are mere symbols of our inability to live in fidelitous relationship with God. They're symbols of our tendency to forever run to the material and to forget that the greater reality sometimes is the one we do not see or the one we have to work to see, the one we look for in nature, the one we look for in the smiling face next to us. Our next passage in Numbers correlates with the John passage, and so I'm going to skip over that and go straight to the first Peter passage, which connects a little bit better to Leviticus 26. 
It was just read to us, so I won't repeat it all. But in 13 to 21, we have another admonition to holiness. But I want you to listen to the symbolism embedded in this one. In verse 18, it says, for, it was n- n- for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty life handed down to you from your ancestors. Right there we have a probable allusion to these material idols that we make. We haven't been redeemed by something inanimate. We haven't been redeemed by our wealth. We haven't been redeemed by that which we hold physically precious to us. We have been redeemed, it says, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, a lamb without defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and your hope are in God. Chosen from before the foundation of the world. It's a symbol we don't relate to very well because we don't sacrifice lambs. We don't slit their throats and drain their blood. We don't vivisect them and set them upon the altar. We do not wait for them to be cooked upon the altar or boiled in the pot. We do not share the meat with the priest It's all very strange, very cultic to us. I'll admit that right off the bat. But this ancient type finds its antitype in Christ, who is called the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Just as it was understood in Hebrew times that the sacrificed Lamb took away the sin of the sinner, the repentant, the one who brought that Lamb. So Jesus stands as the Lamb sacrificed for all time. We have an interesting thing happening in our church. We have a movement in which it's being suggested that we read everything in Scripture as literally as possible, unless there's absolutely no other way to read it. And this brings me to our John passage. John is writing of a story of an encounter between Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, an educated leader in Israel. Nicodemus is a man of standing, a teacher among the people. And Jesus utters this very strange phrase, if you're going to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Nicodemus might have been a good Adventist because he read that very literally. What are you talking about, Jesus? Are you suggesting that a full-grown man should climb again into his mother's womb and be born? It sounds mocking, doesn't it? Here's Nicodemus sneering at what Jesus has just said. Jesus is no fool. I love how he turns Nicodemus on his head. You're a teacher in Israel, and you don't get this? You're a teacher in Israel, and you don't understand? Take a moment and go back to John chapter 3. The brilliance goes on. John 3. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, or I tell you no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Out of this and other passages, and the example of Jesus himself, of course, in his own baptism, we understand what he means. We're born the first time of the waters of the amniotic sac. We're born the second time of the waters of baptism. We're born the first time into a fleshly existence. We're born the second time of the Spirit. For as the Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of the dove, so the Spirit descends on all those who will commit themselves to a life in Christ. It is God's gift to us. These things are understood spiritually. They're not to be read literally. 
A reasonable faith would help us to understand that the appropriation of symbols is vital if we're going to communicate the depth of the grace that's been given us. Nicodemus still wasn't sure. Jesus explained further, You see, Nicodemus, the wind blows. You can see what it's doing in the trees, but you can't see the wind itself. Neither do we know where it's coming from or where it will be going. And so it is with people born of the Spirit. They will be under the influence of the divine in a way not previously understood. The story goes on, and another symbol comes to light. Jesus says in verse 12, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe, so how then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one's ever gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. But just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. What is this that Jesus speaks of? A lifting up, the Son of Man. You see, that phrase, Son of Man, is used in Daniel. Jesus appropriates it to speak of himself. And this notion of a snake lifted up, this goes way back in Israel's history. Another symbol of God's grace We had an inkling of that as we read Numbers 21. If you'll turn to Numbers 21, we'll take a quick look. Israel is in transition. They're moving from Egypt to Canaan. Now we can understand this literally, and it has historical value, but we can also understand this spiritually. We're in transition. We're moving from the present state of things to the promised state of things. We're in transition from our place where we have been enslaved by sin to a place of grace and freedom. We're in transition from bondage to sin to being servants of Christ. And yet he says, I don't call you servants any longer. I call you friends and brothers and sisters. We're on a journey to something entirely new, just as was happening with Moses and with his group of people leaving Egypt. They're journeying along the Red Sea around to Edom, But the people have grown impatient. Ever happened to you? It's the old, when will we get there routine. They're like a bunch of kids in the back of a station wagon or a minivan going, Mom, when are we going to get there? 30 seconds later, when are we going to get there? Three minutes later, how long do we get there? Usually it's the threat of great bodily harm that ends this conversation in a moment of great impatience on the parental figure's part, yes? They've gone out into the wilderness and they begin to complain, Moses, why have you brought us here to die? Why have you brought us here to die? To put it in the modern vernacular, vernacular, we're tired of the situation. There's no water and the food stinks. We've never had such awful food. This was a much bigger deal than appears to be on the surface. You see, in a wilderness, in a desert, there is no water. Water came because God provided it. We make much of Moses striking the rock instead of speaking to it in his moment of great failure, and we understand it to have cost him his journey into the promised land. And yet this act of impatience on Moses' part is symbolic because God has asked him to speak to the rock and let water come forth. Come forth. There's no bread in the desert. 
There's no place to make it. There's no place to grow the wheat. There's nothing that's going to come that's going to produce that. And at night, manna came with great regularity. Now we're talking about bread from heaven. And you see, Jesus appropriates this later. He says, I am the bread of life, the bread that comes from heaven. I am your manna. When Israel complained about the food, when they complained about the bread, when they said it's intolerable, they were literally telling God that his provision of grace was not adequate for them. And so often we do the same. It was a tremendous rebellion. It seems innocuous, complaining about the food. It was my hobby at Monterey Bay Academy to complain about the food. It was my pastime and my pleasure to complain about the food at Monterey Bay Academy. This is different. This was a people rejecting the provision and the grace of God and the symbol that would later be appropriated in services like today as Jesus becomes the bread of life. In light of this terrible uprising and sin, this complaining and rejection, the text says the Lord sent venomous snakes into their midst. Many were bitten and died. So they came to Moses and they said, it's not going very well for us. What can you do? God went to Moses and prayed for the people. And the Lord said, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the snake, the bronze snake, they lived. Anybody seen that symbol in today's world? We see the bronze snake on a bronze cross or pole as a symbol of the medical field, do we not? military insignias, and other places. Thousands of years later, the snake on a pole still represents healing and grace. It still, resent, it still speaks to us from ancient, ancient times. And it's appropriated in the gospel, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself Look at me and find life, Jesus says, for I too will be put up on a pole. I too will be hung before you. Type, antitype, symbol. It's amazing what is here, the depth and the breadth and the value and the scope. I hope that you won't be a people who settle for the shallowest of reeds in your, in your devotions. I hope that you will not be a people that seeks always to literalize what it is that you find, that you be a Jesus and not a Nicodemus. What, you mean I have to enter again into my mother's womb? Smart Alec. No. Spiritually things, spiritual things are spiritually understood. And so it goes. We appropriate symbols, we appropriate type and antitype and archetype, and we continue in this journey grounded in years of tradition. And so it is with that that I would dismiss you at this time to engage yet another symbol. Jesus, at Passover time, gathered with his disciples, had forgotten, who had forgotten to hire a Shabbat Goyim, stripped himself, put on a towel, and began to wash the disciples' feet. And he commanded that we do the same. And so I dismiss you to do just that. Fireside room, we have the women. MPR, we have families. And out here in the courtyard to my right, your left, we have service for men. Let's move quickly, and immediately upon completion, please find your way back into the sanctuary so that we can conclude with our communion service. May God bless you.